Well, welcome back. It's lesson 15. So um, this is going to be a very short set of slides, which I guess is probably good news if you are pressed for time. But I did want to just touch a couple of things. The first is there's a new homework assignment. Um, what I thought I'd have you guys do is to look at the Zeeman effect and notice that Griffith's states 7 and 8, the one he calls psi 7 and psi 8, go from two specific low field states to two different high field states. What I want you to do is to look at the eigenvalues listed on page 283 the, as a function of beta and the information from page 281 that describes what states 7 and 8 actually are and how they're defined in the in the J basis. And uh, I'd like you to uh, identify what are the low field states what do they correspond to? Definite values of what observables? And then in the high field limit, what do these two particular states correspond to in terms of their quantum numbers and their observable, uh, observable values? So that's the idea. Just uh, write out in words, I guess, with any justification you can based on the equations. Then the second part of the homework is to begin our study of the polarizability of the infinite square well. Now this is kind of a toy problem. It's not something anybody probably actually does. Although with nano uh, technology and uh, quantum dots and so on, I guess you, this might be you know, not too far off from something you might actually do. But the notion is this. You get an infinite square well. You apply a potential that produces a constant force to the left in the infinite square well. And I'm going to represent that as a potential that's balanced. It has no net potential the average potential over the entire well is zero. So the effect, the reason for that is simply that it doesn't affect the energy of the states um, to first order. And all I, all I care about at this point is the ground state. So I'm just going to have you guys study the ground state perturbations. What happens to the ground state wave function? What happens to the ground state energy under the influence of this perturbation? And the answer is to first order, not much goes on. <coughs> Um, so, or I could, maybe that, yeah, the, the uh, expectation value of the potential in the ground state is zero. So, uh, but what we can do is look at the second order non-degenerate perturbation theory in energy, and the first order non-degenerate perturbation theory, what is the effect on the wave function, and, uh, and that's what I want you to do this week. So, uh, ultimately, once you get the wave function, you can also estimate the electric dipole moment after the perturbation is applied and see that there's a, an induced dipole moment that isn't there in the ground state before the perturbation is applied. But after the perturbation is applied, then you get a dipole moment. And uh, so that's the idea. All right. So let's talk about the hyperfine structure. The idea of hyperfine structure is that the electron, in addition to seeing the magnetic field uh, due to the fact that the electrostatic field of the proton produces a magnetic field in the electron's frame, the proton also has a magnetic dipole moment. Now it's a very, <coughs> <coughs> it's a very tiny dipole moment, but it's there nonetheless. And so um, we can compute it. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details. Griffiths tells you, explains all that, and uh, it's fascinating. But uh, basically what you wind up with when you're dealing with the ground state of the hydrogen atom, the only thing that really matters is the spin of the electron and the spin of the proton. You get a uh, perturbation that's proportional to uh, the spin of the proton dotted into the spin of the electron. Now the total spin is the sum of those two guys, and it turns out neither the spin of the electron nor the spin of the proton is a good quantum number in the sense that it's conserved in the system. But the total spin is. In other words, the total spin commutes with sp dot se, but neither se nor sp individually commutes with sp dot se. So that's the idea. And using the same tricks we worked out last time, you can show that the there's a relationship between s squared, se squared, sp squared, and uh, and since these guys are all spins, the SE squared and the SP squared, they're both spin of a half. Those are just definite numbers. And uh, when you plug everything in, you see that uh, the dot product of SE and SP 
depends only on the total spin quantum number, the magnitude of the total spin quantum number. Of course, what choices do we have for the total spin? Well, there's only two. Either uh, you can have the total spin as zero, that would be the singlet configuration, and if you plug in s equals zero into that expression, you get minus three-fourths h-bar squared uh, for the dot product. Of course, the other option is that it's the s equals one case, the um, the two spins add to make a total spin of one. And if you plug that into the expression for se dot sp, you get h-bar squared over four. And since the perturbation energy is proportional to se dot sp, that means the triplet and the singlet states, while they're degenerate, if you don't include this interaction, if you do include it, you get, um, you get a difference in energy. And that is the energy associated with the spin spin. It's called the so-called spin-spin coupling. Uh, you guys have already encountered this energy if you've done any reading about radio astronomy because the famous um, 21 centimeter line of hydrogen is exactly this transition. It's the transition from spins aligned to spins anti-aligned. The an or the, I'm sorry, the aligned spins has a lower energy. The anti-aligned spins has a somewhat higher energy. So uh, there we have it. And then I just want to point out, we haven't really officially started this section yet, but the idea behind this section is so easy that I just wanted to go ahead and say it, and kind of get you started on that. Um, it's called the variational principle. And the notion is this. The energy of the ground state of any system is less than or equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian uh, for any wave function. You pick any random wave function you like, uh, use that wave function to compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and the number you get is always going to be greater than or equal to the ground state. Of course, if you happen to pick the wave function that is exactly equal to the ground state wave function, you'll get the equality. But any other wave function, you're going to get something bigger. So the idea is you can use this to get as close as you like to the exact ground state wave function. You simply randomly pick a wave function. You calculate the energy. Then you make a random change. If the energy goes down, you take it. If it doesn't, you don't take it. Or you use the uh, some kind of a strategy, like, for example, the Metropolis algorithm or something to figure out um, how to make the change, when to accept it, when not to accept it, and so on. And uh, eventually, you will find a, uh, a wave function that is arbitrarily close to the exact ground state wave function. That's the idea. All right, we'll see you guys next time.